Welcome to another installment of Tiber's Watchcast, an audio outbuilding of the Substack newsletter, Tiber's Watchlist. Today, we are launching a new series of podcasts that I am calling Classics of the New Millennium, a series of conversations devoted to those movies that have come out since the year 2000 and can, can legitimately or arguably be called great. The arguing, of course, is very much the point. My guests will include the smartest and most well-known film critics currently working, among others in various parts of the film industry. And for our, our inaugural episode, I am pleased as punch to welcome my friend David Fear. David is a senior editor and film critic uh, for Rolling Stone for how long now? Uh, it will be nine years next week. There you go, coming up on a decade. And the former film, uh, former film editor and uh, film critic uh, for Time Out New York. His work has been published in the New York Times uh, Magazine, Film Comment, The Village Voice, Esquire, San Francisco Bay Guardian, New York Daily News, and various other sundry publications. He adds that he lives in Brooklyn, as all writers must. Uh, I will amend that to say all writers in the greater New York area. Um, welcome, Mr. Oh, oh, Fear. I'm sorry. That should have said Brookline. <laughs> uh, welcome, Mr. Fear. Thanks for having me, Ty. Um, when I asked you which movie you wanted to pick to discuss as one of the great films of the new millennium, I don't think you hesitated a nanosecond before choosing Under the Skin, the 2013 release directed by Jonathan Glazer from a novel by Michelle Faber and starring, Scar starring Scarlett Johansson. And before we go any further, I wanted to ask you, what genre do you think this movie belongs in? It's science fiction and or horror and or drama and or art film head trip. Um, if you had to thumbnail it for someone who had never seen the movie or heard of the movie, where would you go? Nature documentary. There you go. Expe uh, I expound. Think, I think, well, so if you'd asked me, obviously, uh, 10 years ago or nine years ago when the film came out, well, I think I, did I see it? I think I saw it in 2013 at the Toronto Film Festival. Mm -hmm. If you'd asked me then, I would have said science fiction because it's part of a grand tradition of very cerebral science fiction that sort of peaked in the 70s. I'm a child of that decade. So, you know, I grew up, uh, I grew up coming, like really loving the films of like Stanley Kubrick and Nicholas Rowe, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like mm -hmm. The Man Who Fell to Earth, where it was, um, where it was what certain nerdy quadrants would call hard sci fi. Which mm. is the notion, especially you know, in, in pulpy literary, you know, pulpy science fiction was over here. But then there was this very kind of literary science fiction. Your Isaac Asimov, your Robert Heinlein, you know, uh, folks like that, Pierce Haggard, who they were trying to get at science fiction in this very sort of you know intellectual, almost brain in a jar kind of way. And uh, Under the Skin is definitely a science fiction film. It's definitely a cold film. It's definitely something that you might have ingested a few things before you watched it, you know, at a midnight screening with a bunch of friends at one mm. point. Although God forbid seeing this film on hallucinogens, I feel like that would be, that's a recipe for a bad trip. Uh, but when I rewatched this recently to do this podcast, I realized it really is like a nature documentary. It, mm -hmm. you're, you're watching this almost distanced sort of third person view of what I think Scarlett Johansson called at the time uh, an exotic insect, mm -hmm. sort of a go about doing what exotic insects from other worlds do, which is you know harvest human beings for their organs by seducing them into walking into a big puddle of black goo. But <laughs> it's also this notion that um, it's this exotic insect that has taken on an entirely another skin and is kind of trying to figure out it starts off trying to figure out how to uh, how to make this masquerade work so that uh, she can do what she needs to do, which in this mm -hmm. case seems to be, you know, eat, eat, survive, and possibly reproduce. And it ends with this person trying to get away from all the baggage that comes with that. And the way that the performance and the direction and the cinematography all kind of coalesce to like do that, to see that she suddenly be, realizes she's developed empathy and a conscience and she has to kind mm -hmm. of get rid of that in order to survive. Uh, <laughs> it's presented so almost matter of factly that you really start to feel like, oh, I almost I almost feel like uh, Marlon Perkins is going to come in and start mm -hmm. narrating about, you know, the various mating habits of, you know, interstellar predators. 
it's actually very interesting you you say that um and speaking of the exotic insect there's there's a scene very early in the film it's one of the first things you see where uh, Scarlett Johansson's character, who never has a name, by the way, uh, has a name in the original novel, but it's not named in the in the movie, um, picks an insect up off the body of a woman. And there's a cl an almost microscopic, you know, microscope view, in close up of the of the ant um, sort of chewing away. And uh, I think right there, we're, we're meant to make some sort of identification. But when I, I, I think first for sure, we're supposed to make an identification, because if you remember, it's that blinding white background that yep. filmmakers love to use when they're making films about antiseptic dystopias or the future or aliens. And then the way it's filmed, and God bless the cinematographer doing this, that uh, there's the there's the prone body of the victim, which we mm -hmm. don't know how this person became a victim or you know what sort of nefarious deeds brought her to this moment. And then there's the character that's going to assume the skin and the character is filmed almost like blacked out. It's this incredibly like, like black is in like a void black, an abyss black, a black mm -hmm. hole black. Mm -hmm. And it literally, I think, cuts from a scene of that character kind of looking at the skin that she's about to inhabit, this blackened character, and the insect filmed the exact same way. Mm -hmm. Like there might even be, it might even be one of those cuts where someone's facing, you know, camera right, you know, the, the insect is facing camera left or mm -hmm. vice versa. And you're immediately supposed to make a parallel between this. I mean, you know, that's film grammar. Right, right. And by the way, I, I will hope to be showing clips of, of these moments uh, in, the, in, the, in the podcast. Um, right. When I first saw the movie, I remember thinking, and I described it this way in my Globe review back in 2014, when it was theatrically released, um, that I thought of the Johansson character as a lure, as literally one of, you know, those deep sea fish that have the little gobbets of flesh hanging on an angle, you know, a little string. She's that. Um, and she brings, and for people who haven't seen the film, her character, this alien within Scarlett Johansson's body is driving around, um, is it Edinburgh? It's, I'm never quite Glasgow. sure. It's Glasgow. Um, picking up, men after uh, you know ascertaining that they are kind of alone and maybe don't have a wife or girlfriend waiting for them at home um, and taking them to a sort of a nondescript shabby ab abandoned house on the outskirts of Glasgow and taking them in inside and for a long, for a good long time we don't know what happens in there but they don't come out hi yeah lost I'm looking for, for the M.A.s. Up to the roundabout. Are you walking? There. Yep. Where are you walking to? Home. Oh, you're going home? <laughs> to your family? No, no, just myself. Just yourself? Ah, uh, it's great. Yeah, hi. You can do whatever I like. So where are you coming from? Govan, right there. Sorry? Govan. Govan? Did you work there? No, no. Don't work there, I work for myself. Do you want to live? And then over the course of the film, and it's interesting that you say it's got this sort of distant third person view. And at times it does there. Um, they pull back and, and take in these vast Scottish landscapes with tiny, tiny little people riding motorcycles through them or passing through them. But at other times, it's clear that we're looking through the eyes of the alien uh, as they walk through the streets of Glasgow and initially focus on men. OK, you know, which one's going to be. Uh, you know, the perfect prey. Um, but then about halfway through, you know, there's a scene where it's all close-ups of women. She's starting to pay attention. Mm -hmm. The alien's mm -hmm. starting to look around and look at other people. Um, and if there's a plot, it's about how this alien predator develops empathy and starts becoming human in ways that are actually more disturbing to it, her, than perhaps to us. I think it's disturbing to us too, actually. Like <laughs> the, the fact that uh, when you see a character develop empathy that way and develop empathy from scratch, you know, not not a learned, not necessarily a learned empathy over years and mm. years and years of nature, nature and nurture, it, it, you start to question your own ability to um, to have empathy for other people, and when you and and realize when you don't. Or maybe realize when 
um, having empathy for other people. And perhaps I'm just speaking about myself, but I'd like to think that I'm speaking for the entire human race here, since we're talking about a movie <laughs> in which an alien's coming down to harvest our organs. That um, that there are times when it feels like you actually have to actively produce a sense of empathy as opposed to naturally do it. And to me, to suddenly see the scene in which she's staring at herself in a mirror and then that cuts to her letting one of her prey go which is the first mm -hmm. time she's done this in the film mm -hmm. this idea that you know she's suddenly felt uh she she no longer views that that person as food but as a person um i, I don't know re-watching it again that scene actually jostled me more than i've remembered it jostling me the first few times mm -hmm. i've seen it you know back in the day where I suddenly felt myself being like, not just, oh, well, would I have let, you know, this person go? Because uh, he clearly showed, uh, you know, she clearly kind of locked into his feelings. <laughs> like all the men, I don't want to give away too much here, but all the men who have, um, who have either tried to pick her up or she's picked up and brought back to this, this sort of uh, viper's nest or a black widow's nest, I think would actually be more appropriate given the actor mm -hmm. playing it, uh, is that, they've all been predatory in their own way. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's almost like um, a spider catching another spider. It's just that that spider is the alpha spider and it's right. got that other creature in its web. And this is the first character in which, you know, she keeps asking him, do you, you know, do you have a girlfriend? And he says, no, his face is, is disfigured. And she's not picking up on the fact that he would be traditionally viewed right. um, by society as someone who's grotesque. And yet he, you clearly get this character, when you hear this character talk and you hear her exchanges with this character, this kind of vetting process that she's doing with him, you understand that there is very much a beating heart in there. And there's very much someone who is not quite believing what's happening to him. Right. You know, that this beautiful woman would be taking an interest in him. You're very quiet. So why do you shop at night then? People want me up. How? Very ignorant. What about your friends? You don't have any friends. No. What about a girlfriend? How old are you? I'm 26. When was the last time you had a girlfriend? Never have one. So don't you get lonely then? You're very nice hands. There's a really interesting insert that I completely forgot about where she's about to take him back to her house to consume him, to literally consume him, and it cuts to him pinching himself. Yes. Because he can't believe, he can't believe that this is actually happening. I think at one point he says, this is a dream. And uh, she's like, yes, it, yes, it's a dream. You know, come closer, come closer. Right. It's like a spider to the fly. And uh, it's, you know, it's then that she realizes that this character, it's not, it's not a kill or be killed kind of thing in a weird way for her. Whereas with <laughs> these other guys, they very clearly seem to be these kind of like, core blimey, you know, get over here, molasses kind of thing. Uh, I'm going to show you a good time. And then, you know, they, they walk into a big pile of goo. It's it's interesting and and yeah I find that um, I find that moment that's when you start questioning your own sense of humanity and the maybe the limits and ceilings of that and I think that's what a lot of really good interesting movies but especially interesting slightly difficult science fiction movies do really well. Mm -hmm. um, you've touched on a lot of things that I I kind of would like to discuss get, get into further detail about um, one thing I do want to point out is I don't she's not doing the consuming. 
And in fact, she doesn't eat. There's that wonderful scene where at, late in the film where she goes to a restaurant and tries to eat oh. a piece of cake just <laughs> to do what the humans do. And it does not go well. Um, but and I think this is clearer in the novel by Michelle Faber that she is an instrument of a larger intelligence. She is working for somebody and she, she's almost an unthinking tool. Um, again, I think of the lure. Um or, well, it's never quite clear. Although there is that guy riding around on the motorcycle who is her keeper, her, you know, um, it's never specified what the, he's doing there, but he's definitely in charge of what she's doing. Um, yeah, it cleans way, up. Yeah, the way I think I described him uh, in the piece that I wrote ages ago about the film was that he's both a handler and a herald. Yeah. In a weird way, this is gonna this is gonna show my age a little bit, Ty, but I kept thinking of Galactus and the Silver Surfer. Mm. Now, if you know these characters from Marvel Comics, uh Galactus is this massive, huge alien being that um looks for worlds to kind of suck out their energy. But he has uh he has an emissary that kind of goes forward. It's sort of like a scout almost that shows up at the planet to kind of make sure that this is something that's gonna give him enough sustenance and then reports back to him. Uh, which was the Silver Surfer's job. Their end of the lesson. Their end of the, uh, end of the nerd lesson, Ty. Uh, so yeah, it, and and the funny thing is, it's like I went back and found an interview with Glazer where it was a, a journalist named Sam Adams who we both know and mm -hmm. asked him like, you know, why do you never, why do you never discuss the exact relationship between these two characters? Um, assuming there's just two. And then there's Correct. not numerous people on motorcycles. Well, there there actually is in one scene. You do see a number oh, of people right. heading yes. out. Yeah. Yes, I forgot about that. Right. So these various characters. Um, and he had said, well, I didn't feel the need. I didn't feel the need to explain exactly what their relationship was. But um, it's a very important relationship in the film. And the fact that it's in the film is very important. Mm -hmm. So clearly, like, there is some sort of, like, you know, symbiotic thing going on with both right. of them. Or all, all of them, I guess. Um, let me just sort of uh, divert for a second into talking about the the men, uh, which you you brought up, and I, it's here where I should point out that um, Glazer took a very, very novel approach to casting this film, in that he rigged up he and um, the cinematographers Daniel Golden, I believe his name is, rigged up a camera that could be out of sight in the van that Johansson's character is driving around. And she, she would literally pull up to strange guys in the streets of Glasgow and engage them in conversation um, and, and flirt with them. And, and then at a certain point uh, you know, off camera, they would tell the men, yeah, we're filming this. Um, do you want to be, do you want to be in the film? Do you want to like continue being in the film? And then they'd sign all the, you know, the requisite waivers and all of that. And so these are uh, amateur non-actors who we see not just being talked to in the street, but being brought back to the house. Um, and here's where I should point out that the man that she picks up who's disfigured um, is, you know, they could they could have done this with digital effects. They could have done this with makeup. A glazer really wanted to find a, a real person. Um, and he did an outreach to an organization that works with, with people with... Um, uh, facial disfigurements, and he found a, a, a an actor uh, named Adam Pearson uh, who has neurofibromatosis. Um, and, you know, it's it's sort of an elephant man kind of um, uh, you know issue. Uh, and there's a really so, great clip, by the way. There's an interview clip with him that came out around the movie around the movie's release, where he talks mm -hmm. about that role and being recruited and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's like it's on a British morning show. You can find it on YouTube. Yeah. Fascinating interview. He's very good and he's very touching. Um, and I think the scene works uh, because it is has a, a grounding in reality. Um, uh, but I also wanted you to to ask you, you now, this is a movie because it is so obliquely told. And we can talk about that in a bit, too, um, that it lends itself to, you know, theories, you know, interpretations, uh, one of which seems fairly clear to me, if not um, articulated strongly, even in the filmmaker's mind, which is, yeah, that you could give this film a feminist reading or a, a reading that men are predators. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to ask you whether whether that 
stuck out to you? Um, how explicit do you think it is in the in the film? Um, and and any other sort of interpretations that you you, you think are worthy of notice? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I found myself wondering. I wasn't wondering whether the film posited male, like male predator, male human beings as predators. Um, what I found myself wondering is that if is there a way that this film can be read as a misogynistic tract? And I'll, let me explain. Okay. Um, you you meet this character, this alien, who assumes she's going to become the female of the species, which, as right. everyone knows, is deadlier than the male. Right. And not only is she going to become a female species, she's going to become a female species, uh, a member of the female species that's so gorgeous that she is able to seduce and lure men to their doom. Um, that's all good and fine. However, as she begins to develop a conscience, and a, a genuine sense of humanity, as opposed to a, you know, an, an imposter sense of humanity. Uh, that same, <laughs> the same thing that she was using, let's say either like her extraordinary good looks, or her feminine wiles, or man's inability to control himself when it comes to things like primal urges and lust and power dynamics. Because that, let's make no mistake about it, that last scene you see, the last encounter mm -hmm. she has with a man is a rape. Right. It's an attempted rape. And how that suddenly becomes this thing that the same thing that she's been using to become a predator makes her prey. And in a weird way, I think it's possible, although I don't subscribe to this reading, but I think it's possible to look at the film as saying like, yeah, well, you reap what you sow. She was way. asking for it, right? <laughs> and not even she was. At, I mean, yeah, she was. That's the always the classic line that one hears when you talk about these cases. But it's a it's a way of reading it in which you're sort of like, oh, sure, you know, the same thing that you've been you, this this way that you put yourself out to like attract these men, even though you're an alien and they're not. It's not a sexual conquest. It's just mm -hmm. basically, you know, they're the raw materials. Harvesting. They're harvesting, exactly, um, has now kind of flipped back on you. And now, you know, the fact that you are a beautiful woman in this world is the same thing that's going to doom you. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, I think it's an interesting way of reading it, even though I know that I, I, I almost know 100% that that's not how Glazer intended it. And I'm assuming, right. I have not read the book. I'm envious of the fact that you've read the book. Uh, I'm assuming that that's not how it works out in the book. You know, that's not the reading that, you know, uh, What's the author's name again? Michelle Faber. But yeah, Michelle Faber did not intend yeah. that whatsoever. I don't know. What do you think, Ty? Uh, um, I think that it's there as an undercurrent, uh, more as just a comment on our species. Um, I don't think it's laid out there explicitly as a tract. Um, I think that the character isn't blamed by the film in any sense they just understand that this is a a way to get what they need for harvesting that this is how you lure this species uh the male of the species yeah. um and and yeah sometimes you can lure dangerous members of the species into the into the the snare as it were um, again this goes back to a nature documentary i'm right. telling you like right. it's this the idea that you know you're watching you're watching this creature that has made her the most made herself the most beautiful shiny object right you know in the field and so naturally other creatures are going to be attracted to that thing and or what is it it's the um i never met like the venus flytrap yeah where it's the beautiful sweet smelling you know scent and then the minute that one of those insects ticks off one of those hairs right. Right. the thing closes yep. on it um the movie sort of toggles between this very impassive distant you could say alien point of view. Um, and then there are moments where you have this just piercing, piercing sense of hum humanity and empathy. Uh, one of which is the, uh, the meeting with um, uh, Adam Palmer. Um, the other one is a scene that really is, I th when I think of scenes in movies that terrify me, that really just reach a, a place in my, psyche that is a very scared place it's the scene on the beach um 
Oh, I can't watch it. Yeah. Um, and even so briefly, what happens is that she is at the beach. She's chatting up a, a diver who might become her next prey. Um, but over off in the in the uh, another part of the beach, and it's a typical rocky Scottish beach with very high surf. Um, a family is having a picnic. We never see them in close up. They're always in little tiny distant figures in a very long shot where the dog has gotten swim gone swimming and gotten being washed out by the waves. The mother goes in to swim to try to try and rescue it. She gets caught up. The father goes in to try and rescue her. He gets caught up. Um, it goes on from there. The baby is left abandoned. It's a, a toddler, like a 15 month old baby is left on the beach bereft, um, crying. And, um, that image I find horrifying uh, because there's no consolation to it whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. And later, the character, uh, the Johansson character, actually, no, the handler, the herald, comes back to the beach to sort of clean things up. And the baby is still there. It's nighttime. Nobody is ever coming for that baby, ever. Um, and there's a horror to that that I, for me, like, few movies have ever touched and it's not gore and it's not violence um it's abandonment it's just something very very primal i i could not have said it better myself i mean i i it's almost like you took several words out of my mouth there for a second yeah it's um yeah i had to fast forward it through it the when i rewatched it you know for this podcast and i, I remember the very visceral effect it had on me when i saw it um back in the day when it came out there it, it, there is something truly terrifying and primal about it and uh it, just this idea that um you know the baby is heard crying you're given the sense that you know the passage of time has happened the herald comes back to the beach and the baby is still crying and like you said you know no one's coming for this baby it's been totally abandoned and there's something I take cold comfort in hearing you say that because there's something so unnerving to me about that. Mm -hmm. It's it's striking mm -hmm. some sort of chord in me uh, where, <laughs> you know, you think like, oh, I don't have abandonment issues. And then you see a sequence <laughs> like that and you're like, maybe yeah. I better talk to my therapist <laughs> about this. Uh, it, it, there really is something so, um, so pitiless about it. Mm -hmm. and so Very good word. It's about the way he's showing that, that um, again, I think it goes back to the idea that, he's doing something incredibly sly throughout this film in which by showing you this person who is not human, you are consistently having to question, you know, your own humanity and, mm -hmm. and what, what brings that out in you? What strikes those chords? What, what are the things that, you know, inspire empathy or revulsion or pity or sympathy you know, or joy or sadness in you, because they're all in that movie. They're all, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, you can look at this film as a series of tests, almost like Rorschach tests, where you're shown something and it's sort of like, what do you see? And then how do you feel about what you see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to me, that is, you know, that's that's a fascinating use of science fiction. It's a fascinating use of, you know, movies in general. I mean, what did Roger Ebert call movies? You know, empathy machines. Right. And right. There is a, there's a way in which there's a way in which the empathy machine is working here uh, on a number of levels that I find incredibly fascinating. And it's just one of one of those aspects of the movies that this movie in particular, I mean, that I really find just like it keeps resonating with me the more I see it. It keeps pinging mm -hmm. that radar ping. This keeps mm -hmm. hitting the more I see it. Um, can I ask you when uh, why, why did you pick this film out? You know, I, I, like I said, when I asked you to to um, choose it choose a film, you just went right to that one. And I'm curious about why that one immediately presented itself to you. What does it mean to you besides all the other things you've been saying? Wow, that's that's actually a really good question. Um, what does it mean to me? Well, it's probably my favorite work of Jonathan Glazer's. I was gonna say, are you a fan of his yeah, previous just... work? Let me just jump straight. I mean, I'm an old white man, Ty. So let me just jump straight into the auteurist theory, <laughs> shall I? Uh, Please. I, you know, I've been a fan of Jonathan Glazer back, running back to his music video days. There was a video he did, and I think it's almost like the closest cousin to this film, at least to date. Uh, it was a video he did for uh, a 
a DJ collective called the man from uncle that mm -hmm. came out of, um, I think it was the sort of like, it was like the trip hop DJ ambient music scene that was kind of coalescing in the nineties and into the two thousands. And if I remember correctly, the song's called rabbit in the headlights. And it is, uh, Denise Levant, who we know from, uh, the, you know, the Claire Denis films like Motre Vie. And he is this, he looks like a homeless man. And he's kind of staggering through this, um, this tunnel, this like freeway tunnel. Mm -hmm. And he keeps getting hit by cars. Yeah. It's a, it's an incredibly disturbing clip. Is that Tom then, York singing? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. I haven't thought about this video in years. It's a yeah. really disturbing video. Yeah. And again, it's the kind of video where you're, you know, you know, this is a piece of fiction. You know that there have been visual effects and bells and whistles that have been made to do this. And yet it is that weird primal thing of seeing this fragile human figure or who turns out to be not so fragile, uh, be repeatedly hit by a car, hit mm -hmm. by cars, plural. And, uh, I re just remember seeing that video and being so unnerved and disturbed by it and yet so compelled to, to watch it. So, so fascinated by it that I was like, oh, wow, I really like I really want to seek out the rest of this guy's work. Right. You know, and he had done commercials in Brit he's a British director, he'd done commercials, he had, you know, he's done a number of music videos for bands like, you know, Radiohead and Verve. And uh then Sexy Beast came out and I have a very <laughs> I have a very concrete memory of seeing Sexy Beast in a screening room in San Francisco, you know, long after it played festivals and people had praised it and just really being like nobody makes gangster movies like this. Like this is right. one of the most tweaked gangster movies I've seen. And then- Well, that's a movie that takes takes Gandhi, um, <laughs> Ben Kingsley, and makes him not just the most evil person on the face of the earth, but again, one of the scariest figures I've ever seen in a film. A, yeah. a figure that made me actually feel scared for my own life sitting in a movie theater yeah. watching him. Yeah, Don Logan, he looks like- um... He looks like a computer programmer and he is he is the hardest man in a sea of hard men in that gangster film. Yeah. You know, you do you do not fuck with Don Logan. It is like it's one of my favorite Ben Kingsley performances too. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you that's 2000, you flip to 2004 and you get Birth, mm -hmm. which is this it almost feels like this incredible companion piece to Eyes Wide Shut, not because it's filmed <laughs> in like the Upper West Side of New York and the real Upper West Side, not some right. You know, not some uh, recreation in London. Elstree set. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Was it Elstree? I kept thinking it was Pinewood, but yeah, it's probably it's Pinewood. No, it's Pinewood. It's probably Pinewood, yeah. But, well, the British studios, they're all the same, right, Ty? Si? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if it's not Chinachetta, they're all the same. Right, and all the, all the albums are, are recorded at Abbey Road, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's this, you know, this very cryptic uh, Nicole Kidman film which asks a lot, much like Under the Skin asks a lot of its lead actor, uh, who discovers that she may or may not be the reincarnation of, or she meets a, sorry, rather, she meets a, a young boy who may or may not be the reincarnation of her husband. And again, a very odd, very elliptical, very yeah. stylized, very formalistic, a very cold film in a way, and yet a very moving film in its own way. So, and that's it. I mean, he's got a, a, another film in post production, but he 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 works so rarely and so slowly that yeah. uh, that we don't get much from him. And I wish we got more. Yeah, he had put out a really uh, amazing, very disturbing short film. I guess it was about two, three years ago. At this point, it might have been. I think I think it was twenty twenty. Uh, that is essentially this kind of this very sort of metaphorical crabs in a bucket thing that mm. he's doing. Let's talk a little bit about the the style of the film, the um, not just the narrative style, but the visual style. I mean, the uh, an obvious influence here seems to be Kubrick, uh, especially the opening, the opening. Can you can you talk a little bit about the opening moments of the film, which are as abstract as anything I've seen in a a putatively narrative uh, commercial motion picture. Yeah, this has a. If you if you love cryptic cerebral mm -hmm. sci fi openings, man, this thing's like mana for you. It it starts off for those who don't know. The film starts off with the tiniest visible pinprick of light that you can see, and 
that seems to develop into what almost appears to be if you look at it abstractly like a spaceship docking like i kept mm. thinking of the 2001 spaceship yep. When, yep. when you see it which i'm sure is not coincidental and then eventually and you're hearing this kind of like beehive buzzing cacophony going on around you which once again like you know the insect parallels are right, right there in plain sight with with a woman's voice sort of trying out different phonemes and monemes yeah. like yeah. you know okay what what's the accent what's the word yeah yeah yeah, it's a good way. But it's almost like it's like a uh, it's like a pre auto tune thing, I think, too, although it might be right as auto tunes kind of coming here. But it does have that weird sense of like I kept I kept comparing it to like a symphony tuning up. Mm -hmm. Right. But but for human speech, right. for someone who has no idea what human speech is. And then it eventually. Kind of coalesces into this extreme close up of an eye with an emphasis on the iris in the middle of the eye, right. you know, the blackest part of the, the blackness, eye. right? The blackness, exactly. And uh, at this point, usually there's probably a lot of King Crimson fans in the audience <laughs> that are standing up and applauding. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a prog rock beginning to a movie. <laughs> and yeah, it's it, it immediately sets the tone, and it sets the tone that you're watching something that is enigmatic and a little cold and a little chilly, and um, not exactly antiseptic because things do get very messy. There will mm -hmm. be blood in this film. Mm -hmm. But in this, this sense that, that you've already entered something otherworldly. You have, you've I, crossed a threshold. And, an alien consciousness. An know. alien consciousness. That's a perfect way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's funny, and he's brought this up in interviews. Like, he goes, the film is not from her point of view, but it is from her perspective a lot of times. Ooh. Yes, yes. And so you're, you know, not just that you're, looking at these men as potential, you know, meals for whatever master she's serving or for whatever function they have for her, uh, sustenance wise, but just this notion that, um, this notion that everything seems a little foreign, you know, and I think to get, to get back to that other question you asked me about what this movie means to me, I mean, we've already sort of touched on it a little bit in that when you see things that seem familiar to foreign to you, you find yourself questioning what makes them familiar and what makes them foreign. And this is one of those films that really forces you to, to take on that perspective. What if all these things that you took for granted, whether it's the beautiful landscapes of, of you know, rural Scotland um, that you've maybe seen in pictures and postcards and movies before that are seen kind of fresh now, uh, or your fellow human beings, Mm -hmm. Or you know this the the, sen the sensation of finding a baby an abandoned baby crying on the beach. Like, what do these things mean to you? And this is a film that forces you to answer those questions. It is not going to give you those answers. It barely is going to give you any answers about what the film's right. about, what's happening from beat to beat. You know who these characters are, what they want. Right. Um, and I think it's that kind of dredging that it does. A dredging that it does in such an unsentimental but incredibly moving and in some cases very tender way that uh, I find fascinating. I mean, that's kind of what that movie means to me. That's why it, it sort of stands above the pack. When I looked over the list that you sent, of potential titles that you wanted to cover throughout this podcast list, and believe you me when I say, like, I can't wait to see some of your other guests dig into these titles that you've got coming up. But that was one of the, that was one of the few that immediately kind of stuck out to me immediately where it was like, oh yeah, you know what? This, I would say this is one of the best movies in the 20th, 21st century. And I would say that it does, for it, it commits to a bit. That's the other thing I really <laughs> love about it too. <laughs> it's like, I can't stand when movies don't have the courage of their convictions, you know, oh, whether it's stylistically yeah. or narratively. And this film has both, yep. you know, it sets the template. It's made by a visionary, a real visionary too. A real visionary, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and it really just kind of it it it's it sticks to what it wants to do. It is committed to what it wants to do. And even if that means it's gonna potentially alienate, pun totally intended, uh some folks, then so be it. But I think the folks that do respond to it, and I count myself among those, um, really do respond to it mm -hmm. in, a, in a kind of very beautiful way. Yeah. Not just in an intellectual way, which is very easy to do. It's a very intellectual movie, but in a in a very emotional way as well. 
Well, I mean, I think, and, and here the Nicholas Rogue comparison is, is I think, absolutely apt, even more so than Kubrick. And it, and it is a movie you can compare to Man, The Man Who Fell to Earth um, in that it it inhabits both the alien perspective, um, but allows you to feel the emotions almost as the alien is feeling the emotions um, and learning them. Uh, and I, I did want to just point out one thing that really, really um, – bolsters the film and just really helps put it over is the score by Mika Levy. Oh God, um, that score. Oh God, it's so good. It was the first, it, the score that they ever did too. Right. Um, and Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and it's not musical. Dimension. It's, it's, it's not musical. It's not music concrete. It's not a, it's, it's not quite found sound. It's somewhere in the middle of all of those that, um, it's as if an alien had, you'd asked an alien to uh, score a film, and this is what they came up with. Um, and it's pretty good. It's I, funny, we used to joke back in the day, it was actually it might have been Sam Adams and I that made this joke, uh, where we used to say, this is one of the few films about an alien that feels like it was made by aliens, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in so many different ways. Uh, talking about this film? Yeah, talking about Under the Skin, exactly. Yeah. Well, Sam will be on in a future episode, and we can uh, I can ask him about that as well. Although I don't know what he's going to be talking about. Um, I think that's uh, about all we have time for. I mean, I could do this for another hour, um, but you have things to do, and I have things to do. Um, thank you, folks, for listening. Um, in the next episode, uh, critic Jason Bailey and I will be talking about Ocean's Eleven, uh, the Soderbergh one, not the Sinatra one. Um, and I hope you show up there. That should be up in about a, a couple of weeks. I'm Ty Burr, and you're listening to Ty Burr's Watchcast, part of the Substack newsletter, Ty Burr's Watchlist. You can find more podcasts, reviews, and tips to navigating the streaming video landscape at tyburrswatchlist.substack.com. Thanks for listening, and thank you very much, David Fear. Thanks for having me, Ty.